Hey, this is Greg from Real Wealth Solutions. If you want to learn how to use your small axe to build an empire, you should be listening to the Small Axe Podcast with my good friend, Nico. Hi, welcome to the show. I'm Nico Salgado, and I chat with top industry leaders in multifamily and business. I believe that it only takes a small axe to build a lasting empire. And if you want to learn how to use your small axe to accomplish your biggest dreams and goals, then join our Small Axe community and enjoy the show. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Small Axe Podcast. Today, I have my good friend, Greg Scully. Now, Greg was involved in the corporate world for about 20 years prior to attending a Flip This House seminar, which changed his world and he began investing in single family houses. From then, in about 2015 or 2016, this was when he was investing in the single family houses, he moved on to multifamily investments in about 2018. And since then, he's been involved in numerous deals. And this guy comes all the way from Alaska, moved down to uh, Tennessee to join us here today on the podcast. And Mr. Greg Scully, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Nico. I appreciate it. Good to be here, man. Yeah, it's great to have you, man. So we have had a ton of conversations because we're part of the same community. Uh, we both are members of the Jake and Gino community. You are partners with some of the wonderful people that I am also working with. And honestly, we've spoken a num a numerous, you know, numerous times and you've been on my, I had you somewhat as a guest on my, one of my meetups, you and Darren, and it's just been a pleasure to be learning from you and you know, and I would love for you to give the listeners some little bit, a little bit more about your background. Uh, yeah, uh, we uh, got, uh, you know, the entrepreneurship thing has kind of been part of me since uh, uh, right out of high school. Um, my father actually helped me buy an ice cream truck when I was like 18, the first summer out of high school. And that was my first venture into entrepreneurship. Um, I don't recommend it. You have to work all the nice days. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it was fun. It was like a break even type thing. I only had it a year. Kind of growing up, uh, my mom and dad, my dad did like the, the 30 years in a golden watch type thing is doing very well but on the side you know when aerobics were all the craze uh back in i got must have been the early 80s you know they they were partners in an aerobic studio and that lasted a few years and and my mom would dabble a little bit in having um side businesses mostly around crafts and stuff that she made so i kind of saw them doing that i thought it was cool um, we did the ice cream truck thing, um, but then we took about 20 years off, um, started family, and uh, Kim and I, Kim's my wife, were, were very intentional about uh, having a parent home with the kids, and at some point, I'm like, I, at that time, I was working for a bank. I'm like, well, I got to either like, be a manager at this bank or figure out something else. So I ended up getting a job with a large chip manufacturer and distributor. For some reason, I don't know if you can say their name, but I'll say Frito-Lay. And uh, that was the ticket to uh, to us achieving that goal of having um, one parent home with the children. Uh, as they got older, got the entrepreneurship bug again, we ended up having a small shop back home in Alaska doing a, we were a women's retail store. Um, did that for about three years and simultaneously started to uh, look into other avenues, realizing that this shop probably wasn't going to work out the way we hoped. And also, um, you know, just how much work it took and the fact that you had to be stuck in a uh, brick and mortar storefront really didn't appear to appeal to me any longer. So, um, yeah, started with some single family houses. Uh, we partnered or we did a syndication as a limited partner, kind of cut our teeth a little bit on the syndication side by doing it that way. Um, had a very small land development deal in South Carolina. And then uh, joined a couple of education groups uh, and ended up through uh, the one of them, did the Jake and Gina platform. Uh, investing in Tennessee. And uh, now we live here. 
were you investing in Tennessee what, from Alaska? Uh, yeah, from Alaska. Initially, I wasn't looking at Tennessee. Uh, I did a, a few market tours. You know, they say, hey, invest where you've got family, potentially boots on the ground. So that took us to Tucson, where my mom and dad live. Uh, they're like, hey, that's a really cool idea. We're not your boots on the ground. I'm like, cool, gotcha. So uh, kind of, <laughs> they're like, they're like, Sorry. hey, go look up the word retirement in the dictionary, and then get back to us, and you'll see how interested we are. And uh, <laughs> it, Wait, so it wasn't they... quite that bad, but uh, yeah, yeah, they want to enjoy their retirement, man. Yeah, I hear it. right. <laughs> so uh, and then uh, we went to Spokane, Washington. Um, mm -hmm. That was, uh, hey, you know, invest where you might want to live or retire. Um, so we spent a few days there and then uh, went to Dayton, Ohio. That was purely just a numbers game. Per door prices were extremely low. It's also a market where you, you definitely have to know exactly where you're investing because it, it's very hit and miss. Um, mm -hmm. But then all the while, you know, continuing down the education path, uh, I had met uh, one of my main partners, Darren Light, at, at a live event. And uh, as a, a, another person in the community got this first deal in Tennessee under contract, he approached me, hey, what, what do you think? And, and at that point, you know, I had known enough about Tennessee as a market, uh, reviewed it specifically for the area that we're investing in. and. and Okay. Yeah, I'm in. And then everything okay. else has been in Tennessee since. Okay, cool. So I want to take a step back and then come back to this first deal that you jumped on with Darren Light. But let's take a step back to the single family. How You were doing that in Alaska? Yeah. Yeah. Is that local? Were you doing it in like whatever? Were you in Anchorage? Uh, we lived for about 20 years in Anchorage and then 20 years out in Palmer, which is about an hour outside of Anchorage. And where were you doing these? Uh, was it were you flipping houses or were you just? No, how they you? were they were turnkey single family rentals in Memphis. So this guy down there mm. had thirteen, fourteen hundred of these. So he would buy them cheap, rehab them, and then sell them to uh, an end investor, basically at retail, uh, mm -hmm. and they would cash flow, you know, two to three hundred bucks a month or something like that. So pretty low yeah. barrier to entry, you know, 20% down on a $70,000 house, kicking off a couple hundred bucks a month. Um, the, yeah. the scale problem raised its head very early. So, you know, you have a couple of those go vacant for, for a month or two, have any amount of, of, of repairs. You know, you very quickly see uh, all of your cash flow for a year dry up and, uh, you know, just doing the bath. It's like, wow, I need like 40 of these or something. That's going to take too long. Mm -hmm. um, and at the, at the same time, we, you know, we had, we refied a house. For, you know, we're very middle class. You know, we had to refi a house to get some available capital. I did some 401k ninja tricks. I cashed in my <laughs> pension. So uh, we also had a little bit of capital lying around and just as an experiment with real estate as an asset class, it, it was an easy way to say, hey, you know, let's see if we even enjoy this or are comfortable with it. But yeah, I never saw the houses. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I looked into doing the same thing. I don't know who you were working with, but I, it's interesting. And, and it is definitely a and I've talked to people who are really enjoy it and really love going that route, you know, you, and like you said, you don't even see the houses. Yeah. Uh, my, so it is definitely a means for achieving wealth or possibly achieving some sort of cash flow. Do these things appreciate in value typically? Um, Memphis is not necessarily known as an, an appreciation play. It's more of a, of a cash flow play. I think if you got to, you know, six, seven, eight, nine of them, it would it would get to a, a pretty comfortable point where as a you know from a portfolio point of view they would be self-sustaining so even with some uh, some repairs costs and vacancies you you would you would still be um you know it as an ecosystem would be supporting itself mm -hmm. um but generally speaking no i wasn't banking on appreciate appreciation really at all or maybe just keeping pace with inflation gotcha yeah. was there was there anything that 
hit you like, oh no, I shouldn't, like you mentioned something like, well, if, what if you have a vacancy? Could, did that happen to you? And did it, you know, I guess, diminish your cash returns for the year? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Uh, I mean, they, they were vertically integrated. They, they're a good company as far as I concerned. The experience overall was, was fine. Um, but I think it was maybe six months into uh, a lease, you know, they walked basically or something and there, there were some repairs that needed to be done. So it was down, you know, a month or something um, at, at 200 bucks potentially a month. You know, you're only looking at a couple thousand dollars of cash flow anyway. Um, it doesn't take a whole lot of repairs or, or vacancy to, uh, to, 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 to make that go away. So, right. Yeah. I hear it was that. a long so, road. I mean, it was just, it seemed like this is going to be a very long road to get it to where mm. I want to be. And then, you know, if you got 20, 25 of those, you got 20 or 25 closings. I mean, it's just that the whole logistics process of it uh, um, seemed a little cumbersome. Some advantage yeah. if you kept it within one company because all your reporting would come from one company. So I, I guess it could be done. You know, some people do very well with that. I was just like, ah, I don't know. Yeah, so it wasn't for you, man. And you then you went directly to multifamily? Uh, yeah, pretty much it was, that was happening. We had a couple of houses. Um, we invested in the syndication on a limited basis as a limited mm. partner. And um, it was just education. Um, I was still working, uh, I drove a, a delivery truck. So I had a lot of windshield time. So de just devouring podcasts. Um, doing a lot of self-education. I'm uh, I'm most comfortable when I feel like I have a lot of the education side in me. Uh, it takes me a, a little bit more time to act. And even so probably today, now that I have some experience, I'm probably a, a little conservative on taking time to act. Um, I don't know if that's a mindset thing or what. No, but in the same it, way. Yeah. In the same way. I mean, the beauty of the working somewhere for 20 hours or 20 years is like, I probably did do that job in my sleep sometimes. I mean, you know, <laughs> there, there's a great advantage to knowing something very well is that it, there's doesn't take much effort, but it also wasn't getting me where I wanted to be financially either. So. Mm -hmm. And then also on top of that, it, somebody like you with the entrepreneurial spirit it's gonna you're gonna start dreaming of something else and then you're gonna take action and do something else and I've, i'm the same way man so you jumped into multifamily through it a limited as a limited partner in syndication that's great and was it a, a a popular how did you find this operator you know i think it uh, it was a crowdfunding site it still exists um mm -hmm. so it was open to really anybody you just didn't have to be accredited um, we actually invested in it through our our company um i believe it, at that point it was probably through a podcast that they were a guest on a podcast i heard them speak you know jotted it down and then looked them up um same with the the turnkey single family thing, you know, got on a phone with these guys, talked to them, you know, they both had uh, some history to look at and just, just got comfortable with them. And it's like, okay, let's try this. You know, <laughs> I, mean, it, that, I mean, it comes down to that at some point. It's like, I can't do it. I can't do any more research on this. Yeah. You know, I'm yeah. not going to, I'm not going to go down there and see, you know, if, if he goes to church or not, I'm just gonna, you know, <laughs> you just, at some point you just gotta act. That's true. So yeah, the analysis paralysis that yeah, everybody talks right. about, I get in the same, same phase. And then in the end, it's like, whoever comes up next is a lucky winner and I'm yeah. just gonna invest with you. <laughs> Let's just do it. Now, uh, did the, did it go well for you? Did you enjoy that process? Yeah, it was fine. Um, 
the, the syndication didn't perform to what their pro forma was. Uh, it performed well enough. Um, I, I was happy with the returns. I think they only, I think it was only held for maybe somewhere around 24 months or something like that uh, of what uh, originally was touted to be a five year hold. Um, uh, you know, there was a pref involved. They didn't always hit it, uh, you know, but, but by then, you know, I was, I knew enough about multifamily that, you know, a, a value add, yeah, you, you know, you're in long enough, it'll cash flow. There, there, it's very likely to be some, some lean months or, or possibly a year or more on the front side, you know, turning a property around. So I was prepared for that. It went, you know, when it, it didn't, immediately perform. I was like, okay, well, that's, mm -hmm. that's fine. I understand. And you then moved on to, I guess, was the education, so you, you'd mentioned that the education was happening at this happening at the same time. Were you also at that same time involved in the Jake and Gino community? Yeah. Um, I, I've been with them since like November of 2016. They were, they were really just kind of getting started. Um, simultaneously, I was part of uh, the Michael Blanc program. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, uh, Jake and Gino was more of uh, the, the JV mom and pop type thing. And uh, Michael Blanc was more syndication orientated. Mm -hmm. um, so I, uh, I got and I got in with both. Uh, being in Alaska, you know, there, it certainly limited the things that I could uh, get very good at. It certainly wasn't going to be boots on the ground anywhere. Um, it was more difficult, uh, at least partly because of my own personality for, for the networking side of it. Kind of an introvert takes me a while to get going. Um, so I uh, kind of focused on the analysis side. And at the time, uh, uh, I felt the Michael Blanc uh, model was stronger. I still actually use it. It just happens to be what I came up with and what I know. There's lots of good calculators out there. But uh, yeah, that, that, that's kind of the role that I took. Um, that's great, man. I. So I originally started and, you know, I, it's funny. I think of myself also as an introvert, but everybody tells me I'm not. So I guess I'm not, but I don't feel comfortable. It's subject related. It's very subject related. I mean, I, I'm very comfortable talking about this, but, uh, you know, you see right. me at a party or something. It's a little bit different. Yeah, and, and you're right. And if it's, if it's new to me or if I don't feel confident in my skills, I, I'll definitely feel a little bit more reserved. But to your point, I was... I started off thinking I was going to be the analyst, you know, I was going to, you know, be the, the chief underwriter, you know, I was going to be doing the finance of, of a team in, involved with the team. And it turns out that I'm kind of not the, doing that anymore. And I'm, I've taken more of the, the marketing and, and just systems role to things. And, and it's just kind of fallen into place that way. Uh, and it's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. It's just, this is kind of where I feel most comfortable and where I feel I can, I can provide the most value to a team. And back to you now, you, you, you said you're there basically doing all the underwriting of the an analysis for properties. Are you working with a group of people? Um, we, uh, of the th three projects that I'm involved with currently, they're all joint ventures. Uh, one of those, we were lucky to partner with, uh, a fully integrated company. Um, uh, we had gotten a deal under contract uh, and we're pursuing it actually as a syndication. And then, uh, you know, these friends, investors got wind of it and they're like, Hey, we'd like to take a look at it. And so we ended mm -hmm. up uh, investing with them and, and they, they basically run it. And we, we don't have a lot of day to day on that one. Um, the other two were, yeah, we're heavily involved with, they're actually both in the city that we live in here in, in Johnson city, Tennessee. So, um, although we do have third party management, I, I think we're probably undoubtedly one of their most involved owners, um, on the asset management side. And, and then we, uh, we did have one syndication that went full cycle in Chattanooga. Um, for that, I wasn't 
very involved uh, on the day to day. There was a different LLC manager who was, was a more support role on that, but that sold in February. And then our current project that's in the pipeline that uh, is a syndication in, in Kansas. Uh, again, I'll, my role there is, is on the analysis underwriting asset management type side of it. Cool. And you'd mentioned that that's, I guess that's where you feel most comfortable and more, most, uh, I guess, most valuable as a team member. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. And I enjoy it. You know, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's quite boring. Uh, I mean, you're, you're spending a lot of time asset management is just managing managers and looking mm -hmm. at spreadsheets and seeing where you may be able to get some cost savings or, or improve something or, or try and schedule out, you know, what, what might be happening with, uh, with, uh, leases and renewals and things like that. It's, um, uh, it's not glamorous, but it's, you know, I really think that's where the rubber hits the road though, is vitally important. Uh, I mean, you close a property, it might take you six months to close a property, but then you're going to be married to the thing for three, five, seven years. So I, I, uh, I really like the operating side of it. Yeah, that's great. And you can, you know, for the introvert, it's kind of, you know, you can kind of be in the background there doing it because you're just, you're talking to the managers, you know, your property managers, contractors, things like that. The circle tends to be a little bit smaller and it, it, it tends to be a little more intentional and based on executing certain things rather than, um, you know, broadcasting yourself more of like what your role is or, you know, Darren who is my main partner definitely is more of the, uh, the face and, 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 uh, and the mouth. And I don't mean that in any kind of bad way, but you know, <laughs> he's, uh, Darren better not run his mouth. anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it just comes naturally to him. You know, it does. He's, he's such a, it's natural... like, okay, do it. You know, great. Yeah. His personality is just wonderful. He's a natural talker and, and a great listener and just somebody who's empathetic and, and he just truly values, having good relationships with people and he's the right person for it, man. I want to talk briefly a little bit more about the asset management side that you work on. How frequently do you talk to these managers? Uh, a couple times a week. Is uh, it set? No, like it's not thing? set. Um, and that's, that's a little bit different than what I hear a lot of people talking about. I think it's because we are, in the community where our properties are. I, I can go down to their office and just walk in the door and talk to them if I need to. Um, but generally it is just kind of running conversation as, as things need to be taken care of through the week. Um, uh, another person on our team, his name is Marshall. He, he shares a lot of the underwriting and analysis side with me. We, we have a scheduled call together um, to go over, you know, key metrics that we pull from our property manager software. So um, I think a lot of what some people may be doing on a weekly or a every other week call, we're just kind of doing all the time because we have access to the software and can pull our own reports and, and, and just kind of have the pulse of it at our fingertips and, and we don't have so many projects that that is incredibly time consuming and it'd probably make it more time consuming than than it really would take if if we just you know kind of dialed it down and, and got a little more checklist orientated with it mm -hmm. i hear that now um you had mentioned that you you know it, you can kind of be behind the scenes but in my mind the way you're describing it talking to managers it seems like you, like you might have to have tough conversations with these managers if they're not doing the right thing or if you're not on the same page. Has that ever come up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and how has that gone? It is what it is, and and they've been they've been great. I mean, I've I've learned so much about property management. Um especially third party management that they've, they've got such a vital role, but there is also 
only so much that they can be capable of doing. And this, this may be specific to our size property. So we're in like the 40 to 60 unit type thing. So we're not big enough to have an on-site property manager or an on-site maintenance crew. So we're, we're still dependent upon um, them sending somebody when something needs to be done. And, and because they have so many units, um, they, they tend to be more reactive than proactive. So the, most of the tough, and they're, they're not tough, they're just like, hey, this is what we need to do. Most of the conversations that need to be have probably come from our side trying to be more proactive than they are being. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, that's, that's the give and take of third party management, you know, no, they're, they're not going to give it the same attention you are if, if you were owning the company that was managing it. And I think that just kind of needs to be understood and accepted, you know, that that's part of the trade off. You know, right. And you know, people talk a lot about, you know, that issue as well. It's like, well, they're not really the owners. They're just employees. How can they possibly care as much as you do? And then, you know, some people have invited uh, the property management teams to in, in, invest with them as either as partners or as, you know, limited partners. And we're actually doing that on one of our deals as well. Yeah, and actually we that, are well. I'm, I'm curious to see how that works out because this will be the first time we're doing that you would think, right, that there should be some, because of the buy-in, they're going to be a little bit more, I guess, resp feeling that they have the, more responsibility and take charge and be more proactive, as you said, as opposed to reactive. But yeah, I guess it's, it's to be seen, my friend. Yeah, just make sure you can fire them. I mean, it's, it is, it, <laughs> that, that is still part of it, that they may be mm -hmm. partners um and they may be the property managers but you you still have to have the flexibility to make a change and that you know we haven't completely gone through exactly what it's going to look like but that's one of the cautions that comes to my mind is how easy will it be to pivot then if you have to break up with an owner slash manager Mm -hmm. So that's the beauty of contracts, you know. That's a great point. You know, I never thought of that. There's a lot that would go into that, you know, if you're going to be removing them as a partner and and on top of well, that. Well, yeah, as a partner or a property manager, right? Yeah, so either. Yeah. Right? It's it's going to be a big uh a big I guess upheaval. Mm -hmm. So Let's talk a little bit about your, your deal. So you're saying you're in the 40 to 60 unit range. Is that because, because of your strategy or is that the price point or the unit size that you're comfortable with dealing with? Or what is, um, what's the reason? We're trying to scale up. I mean, to, to date, um, you know, going back to what we have here in Johnson city, we have, we have a 49 unit and a 62 unit. The 62 unit is a real pain in the neck heavy value add um, once it's fully stabilized we'll we'll be at that 100 unit mark and that's that's when we can have the the talk with a property manager about hey let's let's get a dedicated person here you know let's get a dedicated maintenance tech here so part of the strategy was um, if you if you can't get to whatever 100 units in a in a single complex uh, you know try and get there within a couple and then, and then achieve the, the, the scale that way. Um, some of it has also just been, you know, as much as I'd like this avatar of a property to buy, sometimes you just gotta work with what the market hands you or you may never get into the game. So mm -hmm. um, it's been a little bit of that. We, we, I think we tend we are tending to look at a, a minimum size now rather than a, a maximum size. But our our intention is to is to scale up to uh, properties that can support uh, a manager and a maintenance tech because 
I really think it's a, a vital aspect of the, the profitability of a project is to, is to have as much of that on site as possible. Yeah, I, I, I have a question for you about the Johnston City uh, deal. Is that the one that you guys got in at a really crazy price per door? Yes. Crazy <laughs> as in low, right? Yeah. 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 yeah let's but, talk. Let's talk about that deal. Oh man, do I have to? Yeah, I want to <laughs> dig into that. <laughs> okay. Well, so I guess the first question would be, would you do this deal again? Um. <clears throat> Maybe. Did, how long did that take for me to answer? That was a 10 second non-answer. Um, we talk about that um, for, for the listeners out there. This, this was a, a property that we got at very low per unit price. It was 85% it was occupied when we got it. Uh, it ended up going to zero occupancy for, for a lot of reasons. And, and it's been a, a climb back up. Uh, for a while now. We're about 45% occupied right now. Um, so, you know, can you plan for that kind of drop in vacancy? Uh, I, we didn't underwrite for it. Let's put it that way. Um, so the answer would be no, generally, I would not. Uh, but uh, you know, if, if, if I got all the capitalization up front that I th think would be necessary to take it to stabilization and the numbers worked at a, uh, a very rewarding level of return and we're not talking about eight or 10% cash on cash, we're talking <laughs> about something a whole lot more than that. Than, than possibly, but it is, it's, it's been an education to say the least. Okay, awesome. This has been a seminar and I love that it's been an education. Not that I love that it's been challenging, but the, the I'm sure, you know, from speaking with Darren, that there are some things that can really, really impact and help you guys, you know, moving forward. But is it, is this a JV deal? Yeah. Okay. And it's and you guys are have been able to maintain it and keep it even at forty five percent occupancy. Uh, yeah. Wow. And how so? Well, how did you get down to zero occupancy? Um, there's three buildings. The the the, the property had some uh, concrete balconies on the outside, which were access to the units. They were deflecting and were actually under notice from the city to either be repaired or basically be condemned. So that tells most of the story of why we were able to get it uh, for the price we did. Um, you know, the business plan was to rehab one building at a time. And this is one of the big cautions that I took away from it, that the rents were, were well under market rent, you know four to 500 bucks where the market is, you know, 650 bucks or something like that. So as, as we got wind or as the tenants got wind, that change was, was a common, um, they, they just left over the, over the course of a couple of months, you know, it didn't happen overnight, but as soon as they could find another, this is what I'm presuming happened. As soon as they could find another very inexpensive place to stay, they left, you know, and, and largely left most everything that they had behind. So eventually it got to the point where there was a few hangers on and, you know, we, we uh, just decided, you know, we might as well just vacate everything. That way, instead of doing one building at a time, we, we'll just attack the outsides mm -hmm. of all of these buildings and get them so that we could start the, the interior rehab process a little bit sooner so yeah rip the band-aid i mean it was like yeah rip the band-aid off type thing it's like they were vacated but they you know they were not in a, in a general condition that first of all we were kind of on notice for these decks and then we weren't going to be able to get much for rent on them 
Mm -hmm. um, if they weren't fixed yeah up, right? it probably just would have prolonged everything even more so yeah anytime i see very low rents and a shaky vacancy i tell people I assume assume they all walk mm -hmm. why because li i'm living it and that's why <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> why living proof all right greg i will not hark on this anymore let's let's talk about uh, i guess a least your least challenging deal our least challenging deal is the one we <laughs> JV'd with a, a large operator and don't have to do much, but we still had to do a lot of work. I mean, that one took like eight months to get under contract. Um, and then, you know, so we, we did a bunch of leg work on that side. Um, um, and then this 49 unit is probably, you know, that's, uh, that is our most standard looking deal i guess if there is something you know it's 90 plus occupied it is a value add um we're capitalized to the point that we are able to do um our rehabs we are getting our pro forma rent bumps plus a little bit more um and this is all through through the pandemic so um awesome that's been nice yeah it's on track it's 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 generally doing fine there's been some some dips and waves with with covid but uh uh, we've weathered the storm, uh, I would say, really well so far. And, uh, yeah, getting a bunch of work done on it even this week. And the, the black top sealed and striped, going to soft wash the thing, working on the curb appeal type stuff to mm -hmm. uh, try and catch up the exterior to the interiors a little bit. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I tell you, it's so – I've been hearing different things. Some people are struggling through COVID, and some people are flourishing, you know, and it's it, – I. I, is there anything that you can, I guess, attribute to your end of the operations that maybe assisted to the to the good health of that uh, that one property? Um, I think, uh, you know, quite honestly, the federal government stimulus package has probably helped most people more than anything else that has gone on. Um, we could talk about that a little bit if you want after the rest of this comment. But I, I think the fact that we are in our market and you know i, I walk to our property from from mm -hmm. from our condo here that we can just be a little bit more um proactive and also reactive when we need to um you know we do some flipping here we've got we've been able to develop our our own network of, of contractors in addition to what our, our property manager brings to the table so you know we had a very busy june july where we turned like seven units in six weeks or something and that was that's the busiest time in, in this area anyway because we're a little bit college orientated and that's when people want to move because their kids are out of school i mean that's you know you got that three or four months to make things happen and, and then resettle again and get stabilized so because we were here, you know, they couldn't handle it all. We were able to bring our own teams in, speed up that process. So I, I think uh, uh, just our presence here uh, was able to, to keep the clock uh, a little more in our favor, although we're continually trying to get that clock moving a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sounds good to me, man. Great advice. Let's uh let's jump into my world famous, world renowned, <laughs> multifaceted question here. <laughs> so I, I ask every guest on this podcast the same question, and it can you know it, it's it, it's presented to elicit some thoughts about like some broader thoughts about your life and how you want to be portrayed in the future. So here we go. Let's imagine it was a hundred years from now and you had great grandchildren or great great grandchildren and they were so inspired by your life and what you were able to accomplish that they want to write a book about you great great grandpa scully now mr greg what would you like the title of that book to be or what would you like some characteristic traits for your great great grandchildren to highlight about you uh the title I came up with was, or is, he's cynical, but he means well. Mm. Um, because, and my daughters or my children, they would they would attest to this because uh, they're a lot smarter at their age than I was two weeks ago even. Um, but we talk about things, and I always tend to be 
asking, like they'll bring up a statistic and I'll be like, well, how big was the sample size? You know, it's just like, I, I, I'm always, I, I tend to think what, you know, when somebody says something to me or I read something about multifamily or anything, I, I always am thinking, but what is, what is being left out of this? You know, what isn't this telling me? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do think a, a healthy dose of, you know, maybe cynicism and skepticism can be used a little bit in, interchangeably. Sometimes cynicism can be a, um, the ruder side of skepticism, I guess. Mm -hmm. But a good healthy dose of skepticism might keep you out of uh, some bad deals. Oh, that's it, man. Uh, that's it. A good healthy dose of skepticism might keep you out of some bad deals. I love that, Greg. That is cool. And you know what? It's really providing constructive criticism because you have an analytical mind and you tend to pick things apart. And not, and it's not in a negative way. However, yes, it can be portrayed as negative for the listener, for somebody who's put so much time and effort into, let's say, getting a deal together. And then you're picking apart the one or two bad things in it. But things that need to be looked at and need to be addressed if you're going to move forward with the deal. I love it, man. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know... Try and break it, you know, come up with a, an analysis that you like and then just start breaking it and see, mm -hmm. you know, and that can help you see where some of your exposures are. You got to look at it a bunch of different ways instead of, uh, you know, the rose colored glasses type thing. Excellent, Greg. Yes, beautiful. All right, my man. So let's uh, let the listeners know the best way to reach out to you and get in touch with you. Yeah, thanks, Nico. Um, you can reach us at uh, realwealth.solutions. That's the, the website for myself and my partner, Darren, and and my my wife, Kim, who uh, is as much part of what we do as anybody. Um, we also have a podcast, the Real Wealth Solutions podcast. You can find that on the, the, the usual subset, the excuse me, the usual suspects. But uh, otherwise, yeah, you can reach out to me at greg at realwealth.solutions and uh, happy to talk shop anytime. Yeah, excellent. And Greg, you know, just to back up what you said, if somebody does reach out to you, I know from experience that they're going to get a ton of value. You know, just from simple conversations, I still say things that you have told me to this day. And it pops up in my head, like one simple thing that you said, you know, somebody had mentioned, you know, but I can get, uh, I can make X amount of money flipping this house or whatever. And you said, it's not about how much you can make, it's how much you can keep. And those exact words have been stuck in my head for months now. And I keep repeating them, Greg. So thank you for your insight and your wisdom and your help and, and guidance throughout my journey. And I'm sure that people can find value if they reach out to you too. Well, thank you, Diego. I appreciate your time, man. All right, my man. So have a good night and enjoy the day. All right. Hey, Small Axe community. I would like to say thank you for listening to another episode of my podcast, where we show you how to use your small axe to build a lasting empire. Now, if you liked what you heard, it would mean the world to me if you would subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and write a review. Also, if you want to get in touch with me, go to my website at smallaxecommunities.com. Book a call with me. And until the next episode, keep sharpening those axes.